Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you on this beautiful day here in person. And for those of us who are, are on their computers or phones or tablets at a comfortable place of their own. I am Evelyn Hershey. I'm the Education Director at the American Labor Museum. Uh, the American Labor Museum is headquartered in the Bato House National Landmark, which is located in Halden, New Jersey, so about 10 minutes from here, very close by. And it was the home of immigrant silk mill workers who labored in Patterson silk mills. The couple who had the home built, Pietro and Maria Bato, offered their home as a meeting place during a strike for an eight-hour workday in 1913. And the subject of today's presentation relates to workers and immigrants, but not those uh, Patterson workers in 1913. The Bottos' uh, home became a focal point of the strike because the second floor balcony faced an open area where workers could gather every Sunday to listen to updates on the progress of the strike. Very famous people spoke from the balcony, including Upton Sinclair. You could find his books right here in the Wayne Library, including The Jungle, who, uh, uh, which is about uh, immigrant workers in Chicago. There were other labor leaders who were the champions of workers at that time, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And if you have read um, Jess Walter's relatively new book, Cold Millions, she is a very interesting person in that story. So there's another book to check out of the library for you. The American Labor Museum um, became a museum in 1983. The actions of the workers in 1913 and others like it brought about reforms in the workplace that we broadly enjoy as Americans. And uh, for this reason, in 1983, the house was uh, designated a national landmark. And in the same year, it opened to the public as a museum. And its mission is to advance public understanding of the history of work, workers, and the labor movement throughout the world with special attention to the ethnicity and immigrant experience of American workers. And yes, we have a website like most organizations, so I invite you to visit www.labormuseum.net where you can see updates on our current exhibits and events, educational programs, as well as see um, images of the museum. And you are invited to visit. We are open year-round, Wednesday through Saturday, from 1 to 4 p.m. So I hope you will come and see us. Today's topic for our presentation is our fellow workers of uh, Latino or Hispanic descent. Latinx workers in the United States, their journey and achievements is an exhibit that's currently on view at the museum. And we would not have it there except for the talent of Wayne High School and college students. So thank you to the Township of Wayne for the young here who helped us put together this exhibit. We know that every year from September 15th to October 15th, Americans celebrate National Hispanic Heritage Month. We do so by appreciating the community's history, heritage, and contributions of ancestors of American citizens who came from Mexico, Spain, the Caribbean, and South and Central America. Hispanic Heritage Month originally started with one week of commemoration when it was first introduced by Congressman George E. Brown in June of 1968. With the Civil Rights Movement, the need to recognize the contributions of the Latin community gained traction in the, in the 1960s. Think of your own personal experience. You may have been boycotting grapes or lettuce at that time in support of the farm workers and Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta's efforts to help those workers. 
awareness of the multicultural groups living in the United States was also gradually growing in the 1960s. Too heavily, Latinx and Hispanic populated areas, the San Gabriel Valley and East Los Angeles were represented by Congressman Brown. His aim was to recognize the integral roles of these communities in American history. Observation of Hispanic Heritage Week started in 1968 under President Lyndon Baines Johnson and was extended to a 30-day celebration by President Ronald Reagan, starting on September 15th and ending on October 15th, as we said previously. It was enacted into law on August 17, 1988. September 15th is set as the starting date for the month as it was the independence anniversary for Latin American countries El Salvador, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Honduras. In addition, Mexico and Chile celebrate their Independence Days on September 16th. Welcome. And September 18th, respectively. So September 18th is the, uh, the Independence Anniversary of Chile, and the Independence Anniversary of Mexico is September 16th. Also, Columbus Day, or Indigenous Peoples Day, which is uh, this past week, October 11th, falls within the 30-day period of Hispanic Heritage Month. The Hispanic American community has left an indelible mark on U.S. culture and the economy. We celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month today by recognizing the achievements and contributions of Hispanic American workers and champions in the labor movement who have inspired others. Today, Latinx or Hispanic workers comprise a growing percentage of the labor force in the U.S. I think we can all see that when we look around our communities. At around 16% and nearing one-fifth of the total number of U.S. workers. Many are visible in jobs such as retail, janitorial, housekeeping, home health aides, school aides, in construction and landscaping, to name a few. There are also undocumented workers. The exhibit on view at the American Labor Museum, Latinx Workers of the United States, Their Journey and Accomplishments, is on view through the end of this year, December 31st. You are welcome to come and see it in person. The program is made possible, like this program today, by a grant administered by the Passaic County Cultural and Heritage Council from grants granted by the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, and by the New York City chapter of the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement, or as it's called shortly, in short, by its an acronym, LACLA. The New York City chapter of LACLA's president, Eduardo Rosario, said to the museum director one day at a union function, you know, there should be an exhibit about Spanish-speaking workers, Hispanic workers. If we give you a little money, a small amount of money, $200 to get us started, could you make an exhibit? So that is how this exhibit came to be. And as I said, it is with the research and creativity of a Wayne Valley High School student and a William Patterson University student that really got the ball rolling. So we are grateful to Wayne. Three students, actually, uh, uh, three student interns, there's a, a, a second one from William Patterson, assisted the museum in researching, conducting interviews, and designing the exhibit. Veronica Tarana, a public school paraprofessional and history student at William Patterson University, collected photographs and interviewed contemporary Hispanic workers. 
Lavlin Madhar of Wayne, a New Jersey, uh, uh, a senior at high school, created graphs for the panels and designed the layout of the display cases. And Liliana Barrocal, a William Patterson University student and daughter of Peruvian immigrants, assisted in the design of the exhibit. Uh, my, my hope and intention was to bring some images with a PowerPoint presentation, but we are not able to do that uh, today, so I apologize. But I would gladly share the exhibit with you virtually using an iPad and the museum's own Zoom account. So you are welcome to give uh, us a call um, or an email, and I would be happy to set up a free tour for you via Zoom, and of course you're welcome in person. Through the interview panels of the exhibit, we are able to share some contemporary stories about Hispanic workers. We ask them questions about their workplace during the pandemic and what they feel their contributions are as um, Hispanic workers. And their stories put a face a human face on the statistics, graphs, and analyses. Also, these personal stories, which I will uh, recount for you, might remind you of your own family's immigration stories. And we always say at the museum, the more things change, the more things stay the same. That is, these personal stories of Hispanic immigrants are not so different from the stories of many others who throughout our nation's history came from many corners of the world to America for a new life. One of the workers that Veronica interviewed uh, is Roberto Guillermo, who is currently a Bergen County Sheriff's Officer and a union member, a member of PBA, Police Benevolent Association, Local 134. He is a first generation Colombian and Dominican American. His parents and other family members emigrated to the U.S., he says, to live a better life. He has worked as a Bergen County Sheriff's Officer for three years. He considers his union membership in PBA Local 134 important because, quote, it gives us a voice, fights for our benefits, and gives us job security, unquote. Offer, officer, excuse me, Guillermo was an essential worker and still is uh, during the pandemic. And lessons he's learned and shared is that, and these are his words, Communications, or even just listening, can make a di big difference in helping someone. When I joined the military and served my country for over 20 years, it influenced me to go into law enforcement. At times on my job, there can be a language barrier. But being bilingual is an advantage. I can give the Latinx community a voice so that individuals may be understood. Knowing and understanding the Latinx culture can also allow me to teach non-Hispanic people so that they can understand and work more effectively with the Latinx community. Officer Guillermo was very happy to be interviewed for our exhibit. But one thing he was hesitant to do was to allow us to take a photograph of him. Because at the time we were conducting interviews, uh, there was tension towards an actually targeting of police officers in our country. So we were not able to photograph him. You may remember that uh, time period. This was about two years ago. We also interviewed Amanda Ortiz, who is a uh, Puerto Rican. Her paternal grandparents migrated to the U.S. mainland back in the mid-1930s to find jobs. Her grandfather worked as a barber and her grandmother was a seamstress. Amanda Ortiz is a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing in Bergen County. 
She is a member of the Bergen County Special Services Education Association, that is her union, and also the New Jersey Education Association, the teachers union in the state. Amanda attends meetings of these unions and union membership is important to her. She says, the greatest advantage of being part of the union is our collective bargaining power for our contracts. Other advantages include having support in front of administrators, legal representation if necessary, and particularly during the pandemic, a way to ensure the safety of the staff through requisition of PPE and other necessary school items. One of her biggest accomplishments is earning a master's degree in special education. Amanda states, for a long time, I was the only Latinx working in my school, in my school district, excuse me. My thought was that I needed to represent myself in a way that shows that I am hardworking, cooperative, and respectful because I may be the one uh, of, I may be one of the only Hispanic that this community and its students see every day. I have also had my students who are Hispanic and I can be a role model for them, someone who looks like them, believes in them, and sees their potential." Unquote. Magda Santos is also Puerto Rican. In 2001, she became a union organizer for the Service Employees International Union Local 371, a position she held in New York City for 18 years. She is now the health and safety coordinator for the local, providing members with the necessary tools to ensure they have favorable working conditions. She is also involved with the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement, LACLA for short. In her opinion, unions are essential in that they promote higher wages, better benefits, and dignity and respect in the workplace. Unions ensure contractual agreements are met and that workers' rights are protected, Magna notes. Magda notes. As a proud Latina woman, she says, it is my duty to help encourage, empower, and uplift Latina and Latino sisters and brothers. We must continue to strive and fight for equality, justice, and a better quality of life. Latinas, Latinos are underrepresented at all levels of government, so the, tr the struggle continues, she says. With a united front, we must continue to educate ourselves and support one another to make change happen for a better tomorrow. At the age of one, Ivan Lozada moved from Puerto Rico to New York City's Lower East Side with her family. She has been working as a teller and bank assistant at the SEIU, Service Employees International Union, 1199 Federal Credit Union for 13 years. The credit union's customers are members of SEIU 1199. Many are Spanish speaking, many immigrants, and descendants of immigrants. When they are challenged by loan or account applications, Yvonne translates for and coaches them. One of the union committees on which she serves aids people with disabilities. After Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, she traveled with others to help repair gardens and paint a school for special education students. Yvonne believes in union membership because she says it helps out with issues at work like COVID-19 and layoffs. It helps in protecting workers' jobs and protecting workers from being bullied by bosses, unquote. 
Yvonne sees herself as an essential worker during the pandemic. Her biggest accomplishment as a Latinx worker is to represent her birthplace of Puerto Rico and the entire Latinx community as well. She says, I like to make people happy. That's my vitamin C. She likes to take time with people to do her work from the heart, she says, because we are all together in one union and should treat one another the same. And finally, we spoke with Khalil Vasquez, who was born in New York City. His grandparents relocated to New York City from Puerto Rico in response to Operation Bootstraps. Khalil has been an organizer for Laborers International Union of North America, Local 79, for the past nine months. Previously, he served as a shop steward. Khalil has been involved with rezoning campaigns in the Bronx that bring affordable housing and union jobs to the borough and the city. He believes that union membership is incredibly important. Those are his two words. His grandfather was a union member and as a result greatly benefited from a pension plan. Khalil says the union changed his life. It enabled him to have eye surgery, learn a trade, and earn a salary, which enabled him to travel and become a homeowner. Khalil earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology from City University of New York. His biggest achievement, he says, is home ownership and earning official union positions such that others, he said, look up to him for support, guidance, and leadership. He notes, quote, every group has had to fight what they have for what they have. They were not given union membership books and high wages. My grandparents and others like them fled hardships in Puerto Rico, Central and South America. Now living in the U.S., they are helping build their new country. So I hope you can see by these short excerpts from interviews of these five individuals, as we see, that the more things change, the more they stay the same. That is these personal stories of Hispanic immigrants and their descendants are not so different from the stories of many of our own ancestors who came here at different times in our nation's history from many quarters of the world to build a, a new life. If we take a look at immigration trends, um, we can see that immigration of Latinx uh, families and individuals has grown in the 1980s, 1990s, and in our own day. So it's a fairly recent story um, and one that is part of our own lifetimes. But there are earlier waves of Spanish-speaking, Hispanic, Latinx uh, people who have come to the United States. So we'll just talk about some of the countries and uh, where the, from where they came and a little bit of the history of those different waves of immigration. Back in 1917, Puerto Ricans became American citizens through the Jones-Shafroth Act. Due to the labor shortage of World War I, Puerto Ricans were brought to the U.S. as contract laborers to work on East Coast military bases and munitions factories, on Louisiana sugar plantations, and on Arizona cotton farms. So over 100 years ago, that would be. Puerto Rican migration after World War II was mostly a labor migration also. The industrialization program called Operation Bootstraps, which I mentioned previously, in Puerto Rico displaced many Puerto Rican workers 
resulting in thousands of Puerto Ricans migrating to the U.S. each year. And Operation Bootstraps brought many U.S. companies to Puerto Rico to set up uh, operations there, thus changing the local economy in Puerto Rico and putting some Puerto Ricans out of work. Cuban tobacco workers emigrated to the United States because of social and economic developments in Cuba after 1865, so back in the 19th century. They brought with them a revolutionary nationalism and socialism and a labor organizing traditions. Lectores or readers, labor newspapers and workers clubs targeted local bosses and the whole system of U.S. imperialist exploitation. Through the Cuban refugee program established in 1961, 300,000 Cuban refugees were resettled throughout the United States. Many took jobs in hotel service, garment, furniture, and fixture making, restaurant and retail work. Cuban women soon comprised 75% of the labor force in Miami's garment industry and were active members of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, Local 415. So some of us might remember the commercial, look for the union label on TV. Those are the ILGWU members and 75% of those members in this local in Miami were Cuban. In the late 19th century, Mexican labor became the great engine in railroad construction and maintenance, mining, and agricultural expansion in the United States. The catalyst triggering Mexican immigration in the early 20th century were the, again, the labor shortages created by World War I. Mexican immigrants found new work opportunities in agriculture, again in railroad, meat packing, steel mill, metal foundry, and automobile work. In 1942, Mexico and the U.S. agreed to establish the Bracero Program, the recruitment and contracting of workers from Mexico. Migration from the Dominican Republic to the United States largely began after rebel forces killed Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo in 1961. Economic and political instability during the transition period and subsequent U.S. intervention accelerated the departure of Dominicans in the 1960s and the decades that followed. Nicaraguans have settled in the United States since the early 1900s, but their presence was especially felt, uh, but their presence was especially felt over the last three decades, 1970s, 80s, 90s of the 20th century. The Sandinista Revolution that started in the mid-1970s and the Contra War that followed brought the first large waves of Nicaraguan refugees into the U.S. Another major wave of Nicaraguans to the United States peaked in early 1989. Again, their motivation for migration was escape from both political and economic torment and drought. Salvadoran migration to the U.S. dates back to the 1930s and has been driven by a combination of economic and humanitarian factors. It was boosted by the 12 year long civil war from 1979 to 1982 and fueled by perpetual violence ever since. Honduran immigration to the United States began in the 1950s. Many early migrants from Honduras worked in the fruit industry. A community grew in New Orleans, an important banana port. 
early migrants often worked in the service or industrial sectors in the U.S. Everyday life in Honduras became insecure due to unstable governments, corruption, underground economic activity, gang violence, and armed conflicts with neighboring countries in the last quarter of the 20th century. Approximately 150,000 Colombians had migrated to the United States by the early 1970s. The first large wave included low and highly skilled workers. In 2014, an estimated 1.2 million residents claiming Colombian heritage resided in the U.S., making them the seventh largest Latinx group in the country. Colombian immigrants who numbered 699,000 in 2015 represented the largest group of South Americans in the U.S. The first Peruvian immigrant community in the U.S. were established in New York and New Jersey during the first wave of arrivals in the 1910s and 1920s. The textile industry in the northeastern U.S. attracted Peruvian companies that produced alpaca wool and other textiles. Peruvian laborers came to the New York and New Jersey area to exploit reduced production costs in U.S. factories. And this began the process of immigration that has been sustained for over 80 years. Today, Patterson, New Jersey, our county seat, remains the effective capital of the Peruvian diaspora in the United States. So let's take a look at some notable moments in the history of Latinx workers in the labor movement, in organized labor, in unions. Uh, we do this in our exhibit. Since the 19th century, Latinx workers have participated in union leadership and struggled to be recognized by labor unions and have fought for better wages and working conditions through strike actions. Latinx workers will continue to have a tremendous impact on America's workforce because by 2050, they will constitute one of every three working age American. That's a forecast, we don't know that for sure. The Knights of Labor, founded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1869, called for one big union of all workers. It made no distinction based on nationality, sex, creed, or color. Mexican Knights of Labor members formed assemblies in Texas, New Mexico, and California. Juan Jose Herrera and his brothers, Pablo and Nicanor, uh, in the 1880s uh, were very effective organizers in New Mexico for the Knights of Labor. Juan Jose traveled to Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, and Kansas where he worked in unionization movements. He supported several local chapters of the Knights of Labor, which were comprised primarily of Spanish-speaking people. He also supported indigenous groups by being a voice for the poor and underrepresented Spanish-speaking New Mexicans. Between 1900 and 1920, the Industrial Workers of the World Union recruited Mexicans working in southwestern mines, on railroads, in construction, and in agriculture. And these workers took the lead in many of the era's labor battles. In 1910, Mexican gas workers in Los Angeles, California, organized by the IWW, struck for higher wages. In 1917, Mexican copper miners in Jerome and Bisbee, Arizona, went on strike against the Phelps Dodge Corporation. World War II brought increasing opportunities for Latina women who took jobs in war industries. 
Mexican American women in Southern California obtained work in the aircraft plants and shipyards, while those in the Midwest worked in munitions factories, packing houses, and for railroads. In New York City, Puerto Rican needle workers made life preservers and military shirts for GIs. And in Tampa, Cuban American women got jobs in the shipyards. By the end of World War II, Latina women were, uh, workers were enjoying good wages through many of these jobs they held. Uh, and though many of these jobs were of low status and would be lost to them once the war um, ended. Arriving from El Salvador in her 20s, Kathy Enriqueta Andrade became director of education for Local 23-25 of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union in New York City. From 1960 to the 1990s, she developed a wide range of educational and cultural programs in many languages and pushed the Garment Workers Union and the labor movement to take on the cause of defending immigrant workers. She never stopped organizing. The long days were spent in meetings, at protests, on picket lines, teaching, and helping members and friends who were sick and needed assistance. Andrade and her photographer husband were loyal friends, advisors, and contributors to an organization called Labor Arts, which was founded in the year 2000. She passed away on July 2nd, 2021 at the age of 88 and was a, a lifelong advocate for uh, workers of immigrant descent. In 1972, 2,000 female Mexican-American and Mexican workers belonging to the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America at the Farrah Pants Company in El Paso, Texas, went on a two-year strike to protest low wages, poor benefits, and unfair treatment by management. The Farrah Pants walkout gained nationwide support and triggered a successful consumer boycott of Farrah products, Farrah, F-A-R-A-H. You can Google it or, or look it up, Farrah Pants Company. In 1962, Cesar Chavez, along with experienced union organizer Dolores Huerta, formed the National Farm Workers Association, which later became the United Farm Workers of America. The union gained representation in 1970, utilizing marches, community organizing, secondary boycotts, consumer boycotts, and nonviolent resistance. This labor activism inspired farm labor organizations in the Texas Rio Grande Valley and in the Midwest where the Farm Labor Organizing Committee uh, signed 22 contracts. In 1975, the United Farm Workers won passage of an Agricultural Labor Relations Act that provided for safe and secret union elections. In 1968, under the auspices of the United Auto Workers, 14 labor unions established the East Los Angeles Community Union. It applied labor organizing techniques to housing and urban development. UAW President Walter Ruther assigned UAW unionist Esteban Torres to organize there. Torres was the UAW's director for the Inter-American Bureau for Caribbean and Latin American Affairs. The Labor Council for Latin American Advancement, which we mentioned before, is the leading national organization today for Latinx workers and their family. LACLA, as it is called, was born in 1972 out of the need to educate 
organize and mobilize Latinos in the labor movement and has expanded its influence to organize Latinos in an effort to impact workers' rights and their influence in the political process. LACLA represents the interest of more than two million Latino workers in the American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations, the AFL-CIO. In 1989, the AFL-CIO's organizing department established the California Immigrant Workers Association. Consisting of about 6,000 Latino immigrant members, its goals were empowering the Latino community through collective bargaining and asserting civil and human rights. The AFL-CIO and the Breakaway Labor Federation called Change to Win developed pro-immigrant policies. In 1990, the Service Employees International Union, Local 399, forced the International Building Maintenance Company, ISS, to offer a union contract to 6,000 Hispanic janitors in Century City, Los Angeles. The Justice for Janitors, as it was called, the Justice for Janitors campaign was the largest private sector immigrant organizing success since the United Farm Workers campaigns of the 1970s. Broad support for immigrant rights followed the SEIU strikes. In 2006, millions of Latinx immigrant workers nationwide protested against repressive immigration proposals and demanded the right to work and live in the United States with the option of becoming U.S. citizens. And of course, we know that that struggle continues. Latinx workers fought for job safety, higher pay, and unionization through community-based organizations and union organizing and education initi initiatives, excuse me, by other unions, including the United Food and Commercial Workers. In 1994, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico created the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. NAFTA sped up the collapse of living conditions, uh, living standards of workers in Mexico. In the U.S., NAFTA reordered the American labor, labor force through the influx of workers from Mexico into the expanding low-wage manufacturing, retail, and service sector. Anti-immigrant sentiment in the U.S. grew. In 1994, California Governor Pete Wilson through his support behind Proposition 187 that would have denied public services to undocumented immigrants. The Los Angeles County Federation of Labor joined a campaign to defeat Proposition 187 by organizing a protest of 100,000 Latinos against the anti-immigration proposal. Five years later, in the largest organizing drive since the Great Depression, the service employees, again the janitor's union, uh, won union recognition for 74,000 home health care workers. Of the more than 10 million Latino workers in the U.S. in the 1990s, 1.5 million belong to the AFL-CIO, representing one in 10 union members. The AFL-CIO committed resources to organize industries employing Latinx, immigrant, and other workers of color. Maria Elena Dorazo helped shape Latinx labor history involving powerful movements for social, political, and economic equality and justice for workers. In 2004, Terrazzo became executive vice president of the Textile uh, Workers Union. And in 2006, she was elected executive secretary treasurer of the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor. 
Latinx worker-based political representation has increased rapidly throughout the 21st century. The 117th Congress, so this is last year, uh, was comprised of 44 Latinx members of the United States uh, members of the United States Senate and 37 Latinx members of the House of Representatives. Unions throughout the country have also encouraged their members to participate in local, state, and federal politics. Our New Jersey state, AFL-CIO, actually leads the nation in political participation through its Labor Candidates Program, which was the recipient of a 2019 AFL-CIO Path to Power Award. Between 1997 and 2020, the nationally recognized New Jersey State AFL-CIO Labor Candidates Program has achieved 1,138 election victories, many of whom were Latinx, um, at every level of government from federal uh, to the local level. So this exhibit uh, is on view for you to see virtually and in person through the end of the year. And we hoped through this exhibit to uh, prompt people to uh, think a little bit more about those uh, Latinx workers whom they see in their neighborhoods and doing various jobs around them, to maybe encourage them to talk to them and learn about their story as we interviewed five workers for our exhibit, and to delve a little more deeply into the history of the complicated issue of immigration, the economics of it, the sociology of it. It is a fascinating topic, and we know it is not just history, but it is current event, and it will impact us uh, as we go forward into the future. So I invite you to visit our website or give us a call. Our website, again, is Labor Museum, all one word, dot net, www.laborMuseum.net. dot dot net. Or to call the museum, our phone number is 973-595-7953, 973-595-7953. We are open uh, Wednesday through Saturday between 1 and 4 p.m., no appointment needed. There is ample street parking uh, in front and on the side of the museum. We are located in a neighborhood in a historic two-floor house with a very prominent balcony, which was a speaker's platform during the Patterson Silk Strike of 1913. And inside of the museum on the first floor is a small exhibit about that strike in 1913 and four restored period rooms. Uh, there is a historic kitchen, dining room, bedroom, and parlor with furnishings from the early 1900s, which reflect the lifestyle of an immigrant working family. And by the way, these immigrants had indoor plumbing and also gas lighting. Those were their conveniences. Um, so it's interesting to tour their house and consider how one lived without central heating and without electric appliances. On the second floor of the museum, there is changing exhibit space, which includes in one of the rooms this uh, exhibit about Latinx workers. And the remainder of the second floor exhibit space features the contemporary artwork of Robin Holder. The exhibit is entitled On Immigration and Labor. And her artworks uh, reflect her thinking about those two themes, including some four artworks about essential workers of the pandemic and uh, work she made with a grant that allowed her to interview uh, first and second generation immigrants in her neighborhood, as well as really wonderful collages uh, about uh, working people, uh, people at work. So you're welcome to view those pieces. Robin Holder's studio is in West Milford, New Jersey. So she is partly a Passaic County artist and partly a New York City artist. But Robin Holder um, is a, a really interesting printmaker uh, and a, a great artist. So I invite you to come and view those two exhibits which are on view through the end of the year. The museum also has Old World Gardens, the Botho family 
had a almost a little farm in their yard. They raised fruits and vegetables. We have a beautiful grape arbor, as well as a root cellar for storing canned goods and a bocce court. So you're welcome to come and play a little bit of bocce too. So I don't know if anyone on Zoom or here has a question or a comment. Thank you for um, your time today. Does your museum try to put in context the fears that the workers of this country had when immigrants were coming in? Because I imagine there was concern yeah. about scientific racism. Right. And without the context, right. one doesn't get the feelings of the threat yes. that these workers represent. So I hope right. your museum yeah. adds context to the time. Right. Yeah, that is very important. And this, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, the exhibit idea started with the president of the New York City chapter of the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement. And they were able to provide us with $200 to start our exhibit. So we had some volunteer participation of William Patterson interns and a high school student from Wayne and kind of see this exhibit as a beginning, as a start. And you are absolutely right. There are other aspects um, including that, that we will be taking a look at as we expand the exhibit, and we are hoping to create it such that it can travel, so people could borrow it. Because you yeah. have a problem of a very simplistic approach yes. to immigration. Yes. And a lot of times people feel comfortable, yes. and they don't feel comfortable in providing the complexities yes. of the time. Right. And just to take a simple a simplistic view on the right. issue would be an injustice. It would be. And we're covering a very big time period, too, which does make it also does make it a challenge. But you're absolutely right. We are a collecting museum, too. So sometimes when we put exhibits out there, people do bring items to us uh, to donate to the museum, you know. And that's really very helpful, too, because that gives us uh, other things to talk about to put in our display cases to talk about. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have a comment? Well, thank you all very much thank for the you. opportunity to share uh, what the museum has to offer. Thanks to the wonderful funding from the Passaic County Cultural and Heritage Council. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for your time.